here, uh, Andrea has, uh, has done a lot of the early work on the oxide interfaces. And now he is uh, uh, investigating a much broader range of physics, also focusing on the ultra fast dynamics. So I am really happy to hear what Andrea has to tell. Andrea, the screen is yours. Thanks, Anton. Very excited to be here. Thank you so much, Anton and Julia and all the other organizers for uh, making this platform available and for allowing me to contribute to the scientific discussion here. So today I would like to talk about uh, oxide interfaces uh, and uh, the emphasis is going to be on the manipulation of body curvature and magnetic interactions in, the, in these systems. And um, let me start by um, telling you what I'm, what I'm talking about here. So uh, this is a uh, electron microscopy image of a sample made in Delft in our, in our lab, one of these oxide interfaces that, that we study. So, um, so in each uh, bright spot that you see in this image, so this is a representation of an, ato of an atomic column. And this is a uh, atomically sharp uh, heterostructure where, where two dissimilar materials have been brought together. So one is called strontium titanate, the other is strontium iridate, then there is strontium titanate again. And so what, what I find particularly fascinating, fascinating about these systems is that here, every single atomic layer that you see represented has been deliberately placed here uh, experimentally. So this allows us really to, to build uh, complex matter atomic layer by atomic layer and uh, to design uh, material properties. So our aim is really to try to discover and uh, understand their, their emergent properties. And the way we like to think about these, these systems is that you know, when we create an interface between material A and material B, we, we usually induce some sort of reconstruction at these interfaces. It can be a structural reconstruction and electronic reconstructions in which, uh, so either atoms or charges are being moved around. And here, this uh, allows us to uh, manipulate locally the, the interactions that are experienced by, by our electron systems that, that, we find, that we find here. So we can really think of a, uh, a way to manipulate uh, many body type of, type of physics. And, and in addition to you know, manipulate things such as hopping integrals, magnetic exchange, spin orbit coupling through symmetry breaking, you can also think of um, manipulating the geometric structure of the electronic wave functions uh, found, found in, in this system. So this also so that gives, gives you access to both uh, topological properties of these materials as well as uh, symmetry breaking. And lately, we, we've also become very interested in um, bringing these systems out of equilibrium. So thinking of now of these, uh, of these interactions as uh, time-dependent quantities that are being driven by, by an external field and investigate uh, phases of matter uh, that are obtained out of equilibrium. And so there's a broad range of, of interaction that we can think of, of manipulating. But today, I would like to focus on the role of spin orbit coupling in these systems and magnetic interactions and their interactions with, uh, with forms. And so this is a very broad research field with many beautiful results to, to represent and from many groups. But today, I would like to focus on, uh, on uh, some selected uh, experiments that uh, we've done in our, in our group. So I would like to discuss three uh, type of uh, examples of these type of studies. So the first part of the talk, I would like to discuss the manipulation of the electronic structure of the, of the so the geometric structure of electronic wave functions at oxide interfaces. And the material of choice here is strontium rutanate, which is a, an itinerant ferromagnet with, with some interesting topological properties. In the second part of the talk, uh, I will discuss the manipulation of magnetic interactions. And here we, are, uh, we will discuss the role of light in uh, um, resonantly excited low energy degrees of freedom in these systems to, to manipulate their interactions. And then finally, I um, will give a little um, glimpse of a um, recent result on the propagation of, of uh, antiferromagnetic spin waves um, obtained by, by resonant optical excitation. And before we jump into the science, uh, let me uh, acknowledge um, the people that have been involved in, this, in these projects. In particular, I would like to mention uh, the great work of, uh, of Dima Fanasiev, who has been a fantastic postdoc in, in our lab and will recently uh, join the faculty in, uh, in Nijmegen. 
uh, Yorit Hortensius and, and Thierry Fantil. I will feature a lot of their PhD projects uh, the, the, this evening. And uh, so they, they're also about to, uh, to graduate. And I would also like to acknowledge the, the great collaboration with uh, Mario Cuoco and Carmine Ortix at, at, uh, at uh, uh, CNR, CNR Spin and uh, uh, Carmine Autieri uh, in Voce Brzezinski, as well as uh, uh, Eric Busquet and uh, Ali Reza Sazani uh, from the University of Liège, who have been helping us a lot with, uh, with DFT studies. And also, I would like to acknowledge the, the funding sources of, uh, of, this, uh, of this research. Okay, so the first part of the talk is going to be about heterostructure, other structures of uh, strontium rutanate. So this material is a, is a ferromagnet in which we aim to uh, control uh, its, uh, the body curvature of its, uh, of its uh, uh, conduction bands. And so uh, rutanate are a, a very interesting magnetic system. So um, here we are talking about the 113 phase, strontium uh, rutinium oxygen 3. So in this system, we, we find uh, four electrons in the in uh, in the uh, T2G uh, manifold of this of this D, of this 4D system, so the the T2G manifold is in this system is split by by a tetragonal crystal field, and in addition there is a strong spin orbit coupling that tends to um, mix uh, spin and, and uh, orbitals in in the systems. So the the, the representation of, of spin and orbitals is a, is a, is a mixed uh, state with, with an inherent quantum phase. So this is the type of ideal condition that you want in order to uh, obtain uh, some, some non-trivial geometric structure of your, of your wave functions. And indeed, in, in bulk uh, strontium rutinate, it is found that when uh, um, time reversal symmetry is broken, uh, the conduction band splits, and uh, you find uh, vial points in the, in the system that um, uh, are uh, sharp sources of, of battery curvature in the system, and as such, they act as uh, sources of emergent magnetic field of a uh, anomalous Hall effect, and also some unconventional spin dynamics. Uh, a very interesting type of material system to study already in the bulk. And um, so it was already in 2003 that, that, it, that it was pointed out a um, unusual behavior of the anomalous Hall effect in, in the system. So the, the anomalous Hall effect, as the system magnetizes, experiences a sign change. So you have uh, a low magnetization, high temperature, you have a positive uh, anomalous Hall response in the system. And then as the system magnetizes or uh, you reduce its temperature, you, you, you observe a, a sign change, so a negative, a negative anomalous hole response. And this was understood as uh, the, uh, the anomalous hole uh, effect in this system being, being um, derived from a, a source of, of battery curvature in this, uh, in, in this system. And so uh, this type of, of effects are typically observed in systems with either um, inversion symmetry breaking or uh, time reversal symmetry uh, break. So when you consider the evolution of a, of a block wave packet in, in, in such conditions, then the, the individual components of, of, of the wave packets will acquire the different battery phases uh, in, a, in a closed loop evolution that do, do not cancel out eventually. So they, and, uh, the, the, their net uh, sum can be represented as a, as a so-called battery connection, which is effectively a vector potential or can also be represented as a, as a battery curvature, which is uh, effectively a magnetic field. And this is a source of a uh, anomalous term for the evolution of, of electronic wave packets. So this, uh, this particular term here, uh, which uh, brings about some interesting uh, transport phenomena. And the, the minimal model in order to account for this type of uh, phenomena is a simple spin orbit split uh, conduction band in which we add a Zeeman term so here, the, the spin texture of the system starts to acquire an outer plane component and a, uh, a strong source of, uh, of, uh, of battery curvature can be found at the, at the anti-crossing of this, uh, of this of these paths. And it was already discussed in, the, in 2006 that uh, if you move your chemical potential across this, uh, this special point in your, in your electronic structure, you can induce large changes in the in the in the battery curvature and also considering the the role of uh, impurity scattering you can account for changes in the sign of the of the anomalous hole effect um already in 2009 uh, it was shown 
in the seminal work that uh, by uh, chemical doping, you, you can indeed uh, engineer a, a sign change in the, in the anomalous hole response of a, of a ferromagnetic system. So in our work, we wanted to, to take uh, a step further and uh, ask ourselves whether it was possible at, um, so at interfaces in which you artificially break inversion symmetry to manipulate uh, these uh, this, uh, geometric uh, structural electronic wave functions. But first of all, we need, we need to ask ourselves uh, what, what is the exact band topology of this uh, um, system with the, uh, you know, in the 3D limit, you have vial points, uh, in strontium routinate, you have uh, vial points in the 3D limit, but, now, but this is a concept that is valid in 3D. And now if you make it very thin, if you go towards the two-dimensional limit, what happens to, to, the, to, the, to this uh, non-trivial band topology? Is, is there still some signature of uh, uh, sources of, uh, of barrier curvature in the system in the, in the extremely uh, 2D limit? And so we tackled this question first theoretically uh, in, in collaboration with the group of, of Mario Cuoco and uh, at CNR Spin, where um, they, they were able to, to model a, a single layer of strontium routinates or a, a purely two-dimensional and uh, using uh, a tight binding type, type of approach with parameters divided by, derived by, by DFT and also considering the role of the uh, next nearest neighbors interorbital ho hopping in the system they were able to show that uh, the, the conduction band is actually formed by, by two groups of three bands in this system. And two of these bands are topologically non-trivial with uh, churn numbers uh, plus two and minus two. So the system is metallic. So the sum of the churn numbers is, uh, has to be zero. Uh, and this is the case, but and nonetheless, uh, these two uh, topological bands, they display and avoid the level crossing at the, at the, Fermi, at the Fermi energy which is a source of, uh, of, of barrier curvature uh, in the system. And indeed, we, we find uh, four uh, nodal structure in the, in, the, in the Brio 1 zone of a sharp sources of, uh, of barrier curvature of uh, opposing signs. So one sector uh, gives a positive contribution and the other sector gives a negative, negative contribution. And this is a very robust effect because it's derived from, uh, from bands with, with a non-trivial churn number. So variations in chemical potential are not going to, uh, to affect uh, this, uh, this phenomenon much. And uh, uh, the, the, however, the, uh, the interfacial effects can, can act on, on determining uh, the symmetry breaking in the system and the the magnitude of the avoided level crossing uh, behind this this source of barrier curvature, and therefore uh, the determining this, this competition between positive and and, and negative uh, contributions. So this is the, the 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 overall idea. And recently, a very nice photo emission study from the from the cell group um, showed that uh, this uh, this nodal structures that. Uh, that we uh, anticipated are, are indeed also observed in, uh, in, um, in uh, ARPES. So that was a nice confirmation that uh, we are, we're on the right track with this, uh, with this type of ideas. And so we were very excited to, to go ahead and um, investigate atomically sharp interfaces uh, of uh, ultra thin strontium routinate. And this is the work of, of Thierry Fantil that uh, was able uh, to, to, to synthesize uh, strontium routinate, uh, strontium titanate heterostructures, as well as strontium routinate lanthanum illuminate uh, heterostructures. So for the specialists uh, in the audience, uh, Thierry here managed to achieve something that I find still very remarkable. Uh, so typically when one grows a, a thin films of strontium routinate, these films are naturally, um, uh, they, they naturally possess a, strong, a strontium oxide termination. But, but Thierry, through uh, a preparation procedure, was able to synthesize interfaces with actually a ruthenium oxide top layer. And he was able to, to realize an interface between atomically sharp uh, ruthenium oxide and lanthanum aluminate. This is a, a very interesting uh, physical scenario to, to, to investigate because this type of, of interface is naturally presents naturally uh, an instability. So now if you consider the atomic arrangement and the charge arrangement of, of this interface, the individual atomic planes of strontium routinate are, uh, have a, a zero uh, net charge, obviously, but uh, when, you, when you go into lanthanum aluminate, you experience 
a charge arrangement uh, that has a, a, a an alternating sign. So a plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, minus one uh, charge arrangement. And the top layer of, of ruthenium oxide here finds itself in a in a uh, frustrated uh, situation where um, you would like to have a four plus type of valence state because of the interaction with the bottom strontium oxide layer, but the interaction with the top lanthanum oxide layer would 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 uh, induce a, a charge uh, reconstruction. And according to our DFT uh, calculations uh, performed by by Carmen Altieri, that is here in the in the in the audience. What we expect to happen is a transfer of charge from from the lanthanum aluminate into the into the strontium into the strontium rutinate. So an excess charge that has been injected in, in the system to to deal with this unstable situation, and um, because of the uh, strong polar field, this charge is pinned right right at the at the interface, and the this electric field is strongly screened into this into the SRO layer thanks to this to this to its large carrier density and the small Thomas Fermi screening length of this uh, of this metal. So we have a strong pinning of this of this extra charge that we have injected at the at the interface. And this can be a source of, of, of a modification on the in the electronic properties of, of strontium rutinate. And indeed, according to, to our calculation, uh, a strong pinning of this uh, of this charge at the at the interface in a in a bilayer should induce a complete reversal of the sign of the of the anomalous Hall effect. So the, the prediction is that if we manage to induce this uh, strong pinning of, of this extra charge in strontium rutinate, this would this would completely reconstruct the sign of the anomalous Hall effect that would go from negative completely to positive. And so we, we investigated the uh, temperature dependence of the of the anomalous Hall effect in strontium rutinate. And the strontium rutinate that is interfaced with the strontium titanate, so this is representative of bulk uh, strontium rutinate, displays a negative uh, anomalous uh, uh, Hall effect. So this, that's uh, what, what we normally expect. But now if we interface instead uh, strontium rutinate with lanthanum ruminate, now the sign of the anomalous Hall effect is completely reversed. So at, at all temperatures, uh, the anomalous Hall effect has, has a positive sign. Uh, which uh, is a nice uh, confirmation that uh, we have uh, coupled this uh, this uh, charge reconstruction with uh, the arrangement of topological charges in, in the system. Now, if we make the strontium rutinate layer thicker, so instead of four unit cell, we have a, a much thicker uh, strontium rutinate, we gradually recover uh, the the uh, bulk like behavior. So this is a, this is really an effect that is induced uh, right right at the interface. I see a question from Anton. Yeah, right. Uh, so I wondered um, uh, is so 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 there are, there are many different phenomena that are responsible for a change in the anomalous Hall effect. One is changing the Fermi level, and another one is the rearrangement of the band structure. And yeah. here, I charge transfer is one mechanism. And it probably contributes to both. Do you know what is happening actually? And right. whether but, uh, it... yeah. So we know that the, the charge density is exactly the same both for the strontium titanate and um, uh, and lanthanum aluminate in, in the interfaces. So that this what what we have done here, we haven't dramatically changed the position of the, of the chemical potential. I see. So we see. we have we have induced, if you want, a, a reorganization of the of the of, of the charges and and created a strong pin. Um, um, another question, um, which is probably related to the like the the anomalous Hall effect literature. Um, so, so as I, I'm not an expert there, but uh, the people distinguish the role of disorder and the whole extrinsic Hall effect. Uh, can you say anything about uh, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can say that. Uh, so this is uh, strontium rutinate is a is a bad metal. So disorder is definitely there, and, and it's important. But uh, uh, the the scaling of the of the um, of the resistivity versus the anomalous resistivity that we observe in our systems is not consistent with with uh, either skew scattering uh, or uh, or uh, side jumps type of type of uh, contributions. Got it. Thanks. Thank you. 
All right. So this is uh, basically the the main result of this uh, of this type of activity that I wanted to to emphasize. So that uh, by by acting on uh, charge reconstructions in this uh, in these oxide interfaces, we can we can start to to manipulate um, the the electronic the, the geometric structure of this uh, of these electronic wave functions. And now we are we are very much focusing as, as the next step on uh, interfaces along the one by one direction where uh, the, the, the trigonal uh, crystal field that is present in the system is, is another inter interesting source of, uh, of this uh, non-trivial uh, geometry. So that's a little bit the, the outlook. Okay, and uh, so now we'd like to switch gear, go to the second part of, of the talk about uh, the, the non-equilibrium properties of uh, surfaces and interfaces of, uh, of uh, oxides. And so this is in the, the area of research of uh, manipulating materials with, with light. And so the, the, the key insight now that um, you know, has been emphasized in the field is that when, when you have this uh, uh, collective uh, electronic states, uh, there are also uh, associated uh, collective excitations that uh, sometimes carry um, dipoles, uh, electric dipoles. So we, we can couple light that is that is uh, tuned in resonance with with low energy uh, excitations, and this is a interesting source of uh, of driving these systems uh, out, of, out of equilibrium. And uh, in our group, we have a, a strong interest in uh, in coupling uh, light uh, directly with with phonon modes uh, in order to, to create some uh, non-trivial atomic arrangement. In your, in your in your system that that results in a in a reorganization of the of the electronic properties and, and, and the magnetic properties and so manipulating materials with, with light is a uh, uh, very old type of uh, research question and a paradigm that that has been typically pursued is the one of, of dynamical switching so i have a a complex energy landscape and by exciting the system with light i can switch from uh, from one minimum uh, to another, so I can uh, favor uh, one phase versus another in a in a in a in a phase competition type of scenario. If you now can can couple light with with low energy degrees of freedom, you can pursue uh, a um, different type of approach where now you you can create a genuine out of equilibrium state of matter in which you have uh, re reorganized the uh, potential landscape in in the system. And then I would like to show you that this is indeed possible by resonantly exciting phonons. And um, so driving uh, phonons with, uh, with light, uh, something that has been pioneered uh, by, by the group of Andrea Cavalleri since 2007. And the, the first seminal work was a metal to insulator, uh, well, insulator to metal phase transition obtained in, uh, in manganite systems, whereby uh, exciting a uh, manganese oxygen stretching mode they were able to, to induce uh, the insurgence of a, of a metallic state on the, on the ultra-fast time scales. And to give you a little bit of an idea of the type of uh, light that you need to perform the, these experiments, um, you should consider the type of equilibrium electric fields that you find in solids. So in a type of, um, so at equilibrium, uh, in the, the interatomic electric fields are of the order of 100 megavolt per centimeter, and to give you a flavor, the electric field of a laser pointer is of the order of 100 volt per centimeter. So this is this is not going to produce uh, strong strong uh, enough electric fields to, to, to produce significant uh, atomic displacements. So we need something a little bit stronger than that. And in our lab, uh, Dima Afanasyev has been uh, building uh, a very nice, powerful uh, mid-infrared uh, uh, laser source. So by um, so he's taking the output of a of a femtosecond uh, laser and uh, converting it with a, with a series of uh, on the linear optical uh, effects, and uh, and he's able to produce uh, pulses of of, of mid infrared light that are tuned in resonance uh, with with phonon modes and carry electric fields of the order of ten megavolt per centimeter. So with this type of, of pulses, you can induce a lattice displacement. There are a percentage of the you know, a percent of the um, lattice spacing, so and induce some uh, some uh, some relevant changes in the in the properties of uh, of uh, of materials. And what what we aim to to achieve is uh, to induce dynamically uh, lattice distortions. 
And in order to do this, we necessarily need to access a nonlinear type of excitation regime. So if if we if we were to remain in a in a linear response regime, then the you know we can only expect some uh, some harmonic motion and then a fast decay of uh, of uh, any resonance any uh, structural resonance that that we, we may couple with. If if instead we we send a high amplitude electric field in, in the system able to access a, a nonlinear uh, regime, then it, it is possible to to observe uh, an anharmonic lattice response, which effectively is a, is a rectification of a phonon field along a Raman, Raman active coordinate. This was, was shown for the first time in the, in the seminal work of, uh, of Michael first. So what we're aiming to do is to send uh, a laser pulse that, that can produce dynamically a lattice distortion in, in the system. And I would like to show you an example of this type of phenomenon in a fairly simple type of perovskite material that is called lanthanum aluminate. There is also a widely used substrate for, for oxide electronics. So lanthanum aluminate has a structural instability from a high temperature cubic phase to a, to a low temperature rhombohedral phase with a glazer A minus, A minus, A minus button. And uh, this associated with this phase transition as the condensation of, of two uh, Raman type mode, this A and of particular importance is this A1G mode for, uh, for, our, for our experiments. So the, the, the potential landscape for, uh, for the lat lattice degrees of freedom uh, you know, points at a, at a mode instability. So there's a, there's a high temperature phase where, the, where this mode is stable when, when then it, be, it becomes uh, unstable and condenses in this, uh, in this rhombohedral symmetry. Um, what we've been able to show in our lab, and this is the work of Viore Tortensius, is that if we couple uh, light resonantly with a uh, aluminium, aluminium oxygen stretching mode here. So this is the phono resonance that, that we, are, we are targeting with our, with our, with our laser system. And, and we monitor the, the reflectivity of this system, of the of lanthanum aluminate as a function of time. So at time zero, we are, we are exciting the, the lattice. So the, this is an impulsive excitation that lasts only 200 femtoseconds. And this leads to a uh, strong coherent response in, in the system with, a, with an oscillation of the order of one terahertz. So this is observed only if uh, we excite the system resonantly with this, with this phonon mode. If we switch the photon energy of our, of our uh, laser pump outside this resonance at 10 microns, for example, we observe a, an incoherent response that rapidly decay. So why is this important? So this is an, an indication that uh, by exciting resonantly this mode at 20 terahertz, we have induced a coherent oxygen octahedral rotation at 1.1 uh, terahertz. Okay. And um, so this type of uh, oxygen octahedral rotations are very important in, in oxides because they, they determine uh, many microscopic parameters such as hopping integrals, magnetic exchanges, and so on. So this is this A1G mode that I was pointing out before that, um, that is the uh, responsible for the, uh, for the rhombohedral distortion of this, uh, of this material. So when we excite resonant phonons, we do in, indeed uh, generate coherent uh, octahedral rotations in, uh, in, this, uh, in, in these oxides. This is one aspect. Uh, the second thing that, that, that happen is the generation of strain waves. Uh, and this has to do with the electrostrictive response of, uh, of, of complex oxides. So when, when you're exciting the system at resonance, uh, the, uh, essentially the electric field will, will penetrate within the material uh, within an, an extension depth, which is uh, in the 100 nanometer range. And, and within, within this, uh, this depth, the, the material will experience very large electric fields of the order of, of, ten, of tens of megavolts per centimeter. And because of the electrostrictive effect, then uh, there was measured, for example, in lanthanum aluminate in this, uh, in this work in 2011, we, we expect a significant lattice expansion of the material of the order of a, of, of a few percent. So with 20 megavolts per centimeter in LAO, you expect a 2% lattice expansion. And this is a, a source of the generation of a strain wave that then propagates in, into the material. So at time zero, so this is shown in this uh, measurement here of polarization rotation versus time. 
where this pattern of oscillations is a uh, uh, interference pat pattern that is uh, that is produced by a propagating strain wave across uh, across your your material that moves at the at the speed of sound. And this uh, this um, strain wave is a direct response to this uh, lattice expansion that we have caused at, at the surface of the of the material within uh, an, an extension depth. And from from this oscillation pattern, we can uh, reconstruct. Um, the propagation in the system of both a, a transversal strain wave as a, and a longitudinal strain wave. So a longitudinal strain wave is uh, something that is observed quite commonly with, uh, with this type of ultra-fast uh, optical stimulation of materials, but uh, a transversal strain wave is, is actually quite, uh, quite unique. And, um, and this, has, uh, something, this has to do with the an anisotropic optical properties of these, uh, of these oxides. Actually, the, inten the relative intensity of longitudinal and transversal strain waves can be tuned by changing the photon energy uh, that uh, you use to excite the system. So to recap, uh, when we um, excite a, a uh, complex oxides at resonance with uh, you know, one of its phonon modes, we, we typically uh, uh, cause a generation of uh, coherent optional tahedral rotation and of uh, strain waves propagating uh, across the, the, the material, both longitudinal strain waves and transversal uh, strain waves. And this can be utilized to manipulate, for example, a thin film uh, on top of this of this substrate. So if you now you take lanthanum aluminate and you, so this substrate that I just uh, showed you that has this interesting uh, structural responses and you, you put it on top an epitaxial layer of, of, uh, of a material that has uh, some interesting electronic properties, you can observe some, some, uh, some interesting physics. So this is a, uh, an example of, uh, of this type of uh, ultra-fast strain engineering that, that, that we study. So the material of choice here is nadimium nickelate. So this material has a metal to insulator phase transition occurring at around 130 Kelvin, which is uh, uh, related to, to mod physics in, in this system. And especially this, uh, this um, transition occurs inhomogeneously. So this, so this is a, a first order type of phase transition with nucleation and growth of, of domains. And a few years ago, we were able to map uh, this type of uh, domain nucleation and growth using the photoemission electron microscopy uh, techniques. So what we can do now is to uh, induce this, this type of transition on the ultra-fast uh, uh, time scales by, by acting on, on the crystal lattice. And um, this is made possible by, by the fact that this phase transition is strongly tied to a structural mode that is present in, in the system. So in the, in the low temperature um, antiferromagnetic insulating state, nadimium nickelate um, undergoes a breathing distortion of its, of its oxygen oct octahedra and acquires a checkerboard pattern of, uh, uh, of nickel sites that have di a different local density of states. And uh, by, by, so a few years ago, we were able to show that by uh, exciting the, the substrate here, so lanthanum aluminate, and inducing these, these strain waves, we, we could um, essentially generate a, um, a, a supersonic uh, magnetic phase front where, where the antiferromagnetic order is melted. And, uh, and uh, this, this phase front pro propagates at a, at a speed that is well in, in excess of the speed of sound. So a magnetic, uh, a magnetic melting wave that is, that is produced by, by this uh, uh, strain excitation right, right at, the, at the interface between, between the, the, the two materials. So this uh, is it's an example of an order-disorder type of phase transition that, that can be induced by lattice excitation. But more, more importantly, can we also control transition between order states? So can we also go from uh, a uh, um, magnetic phase with a, with a certain type of symmetry to a competing magnetic phase with a different type of symmetry? So that's the question that we asked recently. And uh, so we performed this type of study um, with a material called dysprosium mortiferite. So I see that my time is running out. So I should be going a little bit faster. So the uh, material of choice here is called dysprosium mortiferite, and it displays a first order phase transition between a low temperature antiferromagnetic state uh, to a high temperature weakly ferromagnetic state. 
where uh, the spins in the system reorient, reorient from the from the uh, y axis to the to the x axis and they acquire a net uh, monetization because of a, of a of a counting so this this spin orientation is also known as the as the marine transition and in the system occurs around uh, 50 kelvin what we, we wanted to, to investigate is um, if we now bring the system out of equilibrium by, by resonantly exciting a uh, phonon mode, uh, can we actually uh, induce a transition from the antiferromagnetic state to the, to the ferromagnetic state? We know that we induce this, uh, this lattice distortions around, along a Raman active coordinate. And according to, to our DFT calculation, this is expected to induce a change in the uh, super exchange interaction between the uh, ion 3 plus and, and the dysprosium 3 plus in the, in the system. And um, the way we perform this type of investigation, uh, we uh, perform um, spectroscopy of the spin waves in, in the system. And so the spin waves, they are a direct probe of the, of the potential landscape of the system uh, as the frequency is set by the curvature of the, of the magnetic potential of, uh, of, of our material. So in, uh, in our experiment, we perform uh, pump probe measurements in which uh, the pump is a laser pulse that is either tuned in resonance with the phonon or not. And the probe pulse is, is a, uh, a sh short uh, 400 nanometer beam of which we measure the, the Faraday rotation. And the Faraday rotation in this prosium orthophorite in the particular geometry of our experiment is sensitive to the uh, out of plane uh, monetization. So this is the work of, uh, uh, of Dima and, uh, and Yorit. And um, so if you excite now the system off resonance, you do in the, and you're in the low temperature antiferromagnetic phase, and you measure the Faraday rotation versus time, you do indeed measure uh, spin waves being excited in the material through an impulsive stimulated uh, Raman uh, scattering uh, process. And the spin waves are of the, have a frequency of the order of 150 gigahertz. If now you switch your, your laser um, wavelength and you tune it in resonance with the, with the phonon mode, now you ag again see uh, a spin wave being excited in, in the material, but now the frequency itself of the wave has been shifted to much lower frequencies. So from a, from a uh, wave at 150 gigahertz, now you, you move down to 120 gigahertz. So this is a direct indication that by exciting the phonons, we are, uh, we are remodulating the, the uh, curvature of the, of the magnetic potential of, uh, of uh, this prosium orthophorite. So the, a red shift is indicating actually a softening of the, of the, of the potential, so a flattening of the, of the potential landscape. If we perform the same experiment in the high temperature weekly ferromagnetic phase, we also observe a change in the magnetic landscape. And this time, rather than a, than a softening, we observe a blue shift, so a hardening of the, of the, of the curvature of the, of, of the potential. So this is uh, maybe more, uh, more clear in this type of uh, uh, plots, where we are looking at the, at the photon energy, uh, so the frequency versus photon energy. And you see that uh, if, your, uh, if your excitation is tuning resonance with, uh, with, with the phonon mode, with the prosium orthophorite, the, the frequency of, of your spin waves is, is strongly uh, softened. So there is a, a change in the magnetic energy landscape that, that is produced by phonon excitation. And um, this happens very rapidly. So the, in, in a few picoseconds within one period of, uh, of precession of the spins, you, you have already settled in, in, a, in a new potential. And it takes uh, up to uh, hundreds of picoseconds for your system to relax back uh, to the to the to the equilibrium state. So we have induced a, a out of equilibrium configuration of the of the magnetic energy landscape that persists for the order of 100 picoseconds. So this uh, uh, is an is an interesting scenario because we have created a metastable state in which the the, the low temperature. Uh, so this uh, it's an auto it's an out of equilibrium state in which the low temperature. Um, uh, antiferromagnetic ground state of the system now is suddenly becoming metastable. So if the system is, is excited with precession to a strong, to a large enough amplitude, it's possible now to uh, settle in the in the competing uh, phase on on very fast uh, time scales. 
So it is possible to now to envisage to envisage a switching from the low temperature antiferromagnetic state to uh, the high temperature weakly ferromagnetic state in which the system acquires a magnetization. So induce a transition between between order states. And this is indeed uh, uh, possible. Uh, so and this is shown in this series of measurements here. So this is Faraday rotation uh, versus time. So at uh, equilibrium, uh, the system is in the low temperature antiferromagnetic state. So there is no uh, Faraday rotation uh, in, the, in the system. At, at, at time zero, uh, we excite phonons with a, with a, in this case with small uh, with a small amplitude excitation and this induces a harmonic response and a, and a decay back to equilibrium if we now we crank up the power of the laser we start to see that the system acquires a uh, a monetization so now your, your net further uh, rotation becomes uh, uh, becomes uh, very large and uh, the switch, so this is indicating a, a switching from the uh, from the low temperature antiferromagnetic state to uh, this um, uh, magnetic phase with with a net magnetization in the, in, in the system. And very interestingly, the transition occurs within the first period of of, of the of the of the spin procession. And this is a uh, it's a process that has a very uh, well defined threshold. It, it requires a certain amount of uh, of power. For, for this uh, for this event to, to, to occur and uh, so we have, we were quite excited to see that with the with phonon pumping we are, we are able to uh, address the the low energy degrees of freedom in the system inducing a, a transition occurring on on extremely fast uh, time scales and uh, this is uh, also uh, uh, quite interesting if you compare uh, what happens in this system if you excite instead of phonons the electronic degrees of freedom so uh, so this is shown in this uh, in this measurement here where instead of exciting phonons we're exciting a charge transfer band so electronic degrees of freedom in the system so this is the further rotation and you see that the system starts to process and then eventually it develops a monetization in a on a time scale of the order of a, of 100 picosecond so this is indicating that you're exciting electronic degrees of freedom uh, the spins are, are also excited, but then the in order to to uh, have a transition to the to the to the ferromagnetic state, you, you need to uh, release energy into the into the uh, to the into the spin system incoherently. So that's that's if you want a, it's an ultra fast heating effect. With the with the approach that we that we proposed here by uh, addressing restaurantly the the phonons, you can induce the transition to the to the ferromagnetic state within a few a few picoseconds, so rather than than hundred uh, picoseconds. So this uh, type of ultra fast lattice excitation can uh, result in in very fast uh, and long living modification of magnetic interactions, and uh, can can result in a uh, um, Transition. Uh, there is there is non-thermal. There is uh, uh, occurring through a truly out of equilibrium state. Okay. Uh, so I I'm running out of time. So I will conclude uh, very briefly by mentioning um, about uh, sp spin waves in in this system. So I shown you at, at the beginning that by by exciting uh, resonantly. Um, the, the system with the, with optical pulses, you can confine the spatially your your excitation on the on the nanometer length scales, and this leads to to propagating uh, acoustic waves in, in the system. And now it's also interesting to ask whether it, it is possible to induce the, the propagation of of uh, uh, antiferromagnetic spin waves with using a similar uh, approach. And uh, um, Engineering spin transport in antiferromagnet it's a it's a very important interesting uh, research direction um, uh, because this would, would allow us to to envisage manipulation of of information at terahertz uh, frequencies with with uh, propagation speeds of, of the orders of, of tens of kilometer uh, per second, which would not be possible with uh, within uh, uh, schemes where where we we are propagating. Uh, spin currents in in ferromagnets. So the, the, the idea here was to um, engineer spatial confinement of, of optical excitations in, in, in an antiferromagnet um, by by tuning the photon energy photon energies at, at resonance in, in this case of, of uh, electronic transitions 
this this results in the creation of a of a wave packet and uh, uh, the, the momentum distribution of, of a wave packet is determined by by the uh, confinement length of our of our electromagnetic waves and indeed uh, this this results in the in a ballistic uh, propagation of, of spin waves across across your material that propagate up to 12 kilometers per second ballistically uh, in uh, in up to a microns in in, in distance uh, so this uh, highlights again the the, the potential of uh, of optical excitations of of resonances in uh, in, in solids uh, in order to to to, in, to induce um, propagation phenomena right so this brings me to my to my conclusion uh, if you're if you're interested in the research topics that uh, that uh, we studied in, in our group please consider consider joining us so we have uh, several postdoc and phd positions open uh, next year so if you if you would like to, to know more about it please uh, get in touch i'll be i'll be delighted to to illustrate uh, our new projects uh, at you and uh, so this, uh, so these are the references of, uh, of the paper uh, that I discussed today. And I would like to thank again the, all the members of, of the group for uh, for their collaboration, and and you for your for your attention.